Grab your Bibles. We're going to jump into the Word this morning. Um, just a simple word I want to share with you. Romans chapter 12. Go to Romans chapter 12. We're going to read there verses 17 through 21. And then we're going to walk through that and allow God um, just to move and have his way in our midst this morning. Amen. When you are in Romans chapter 12, let me know by saying amen, amen. so we can read together and like God. So here's what it reads. It begins in verse 17 by saying, Repay to no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him or her something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on their head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. Pray with me and let us go into the word of God. Holy Spirit, speak this morning. Um, we want your fresh, a fresh anointing from you. We don't want this 9 o'clock service anointing. but We want your service, God, on this evening as we go into the word. So speak afresh to this congregation what you would want them to hear by way of truths from your word. So we thank you for what you're doing we thank you for who you are, open our hearts to hear, and to be more like you. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Now I need you all to repeat after me before we even go into the, to the message. Well, I'll get to that in a while. But let me, let me say this. Um, I was sharing with first service this morning. When I was a little boy, uh, I don't, this, this doesn't happen anymore. It, so this is like really, really old school stuff. We used to have what we call um, neighborhood fights or block fights. Okay? Um, y'all know, know about that, right? Y'all call them gangs these days, right? Yeah, right, right, right. So what would happen, what would happen is, is where I grew up on my side of the street, everybody would congregate together, right? And then if somebody did something wrong to the other person, we would just get together, go over, and we would use this word called retaliate, right? Y'all know about that, right? Back then it was safe. Nobody had guns and nobody had sticks. It's just all fists. You kind of get where I'm going. So I remember, I remember I came from a pretty large family, so my family... It was about um, nine children in our family. Yeah, we didn't have a TV. I get it. Um, it about nine kids in our family. And what that meant is that the, the likelihood of my family being the baddest on the block existed. Because if you hit one, we won't we wouldn't start a fight right then and there. It wasn't like that. We'd go home, and then we'd roll up on you nine deep. <laughs> Oh, that, that's how it was, right? I mean, from the little one to the big one. And then we'd beat the snot out of you or just be, it was retaliation. You kind of get where I'm going? Um, that was in the day I was sharing. This is so funny. This was in the day of, Kung, remember Kung Fu? Yeah, remember that movie Kung Fu? And everybody wanted to learn karate back then. I used to be in the street with these stupid little moves, whatever it was. <laughs> but the point, the point of the illustration was that when somebody wronged you, this, this concept or this mindset of naturally retaliating to defend yourself was something that we did. And as a result, you end up, you grow up with that framework, you grow up with that mindset, you grow up with this concept that if anybody wrongs me, by default, I'm going to retaliate, I'm going to repay evil for evil, if I could use that term, because we, nobody wants to be you know, made a fool of or feel as if they're less than. But I want to, as we go to the Word this morning, I want you to see from God's Word that when you come into a relationship with God, there's a different expectation from God as it relates to how we conduct ourselves in the world. Here's something I want you to process with me. I believe it was, um, it was a Wednesday evening, January 17th, 2015. Some of you may remember the date, the time, and the incident. Here's what happened on that date. Charlottesville, South Carolina, at a church in South Carolina, historically black church known as the Emmanuel Episcopal AME Church, that's African Methodist Episcopal, known as the Mother Church because it was one of the oldest church that existed in the southern states at that time, um, several, you know, a couple hundred years old. What happened in the church on that Wednesday evening was 
some faithful members of the church got together for a Bible study as just like we do on Wednesday night. They were in the basement of the church. They were sitting in there studying God's word. Then a young male, 21 years old, walks into the building and the congregation welcomes him because just like any church would do, whenever you see a visitor, whenever a person enters your facility, your natural response is to welcome them because you want them to feel a part of what you are doing. The Bible study ensued, it continued, it continued on. The young man participated in the Bible study with the congregation. I wasn't there, but I would assume talked, asked questions. They had a, in any event, people in the congregation at the time felt safe because everything was going well. As the story went on, the congregation bowed their head to pray to be dismissed. This young man by the name of Dylan Roof reach on his side, pulls out a gun, and starts shooting members in the congregation. I think to the tune of nine people died innocently that evening when they left their house going to church to worship and to study the Word of God. Dylan was caught a couple of days or so later, and he left, well, here's what, he left a few people alive so they could tell what he did, and why he did what he did. Narrative says and reporter says that they, um, the people that were left alive, that Dylan were yelling um, obscenities, um, calling the people names. It was pretty much a hate crime. And when you look at our country, it's, it's a sad situation because I brought that up to say, if I'm in that church and one of my family members were murdered in the situation, how would I respond? I think, let me transfer that to you. How would you respond, right? And, and, and it's, it's easy to sit in church and play holy and say I would respond this way or that way. But in the moment, would you go back to my childhood, you kind of get where I'm going, and gather your stuff and, for lack of a better term, say, I'm going to go handle my business, Come on, let's, can we be honest this morning? How would you respond? And what's the biblical response? And what is this word trying to teach us today? And when you look at the country, you look at our culture, there's a lot of this craziness that's going on in our culture today. We just had a very similar situation with the synagogue in Pittsburgh, right? Um, a person goes in there and just kills, I think now, 11 plus people while they're in their worship environment. Same thing just happened in California in a bar where a Marine, uh, they're referring to him as an ex-Marine, um, that, that was discharged, goes and just kills people. And then you think of the family members that have lost loved ones in those situations. What should their response be? How do you expect them to respond? And if, if, if by default, let me just go here, by default, our natural inclination is to want to retaliate, to get even, or we want justice to be served so we can feel vindicated for the wrong that is done. Well, that's the pattern of the world, if I could use the term. The world has a way of responding to things, but then there's a way that God fully expects or anticipates that the church or his people respond to situations and circumstances like that. This text that we have in front of us, Paul, in the book of Romans, is beginning this process of teaching us what it means to adopt kingdom principles in our lives since we've been on the subject of reestablishing the kingdom of God. Now that I'm a kingdom subject, what is my ex anticipated response? What does God, how does God want me to respond? And more importantly, what would God want out of this situation? So when you look at this passage that's in front of us, it really begins in the first verse of Romans chapter 12. So back up with me to Romans chapter 12. Let's walk through this, then we're going to walk through what I want to share with you. Paul opens up by saying, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to present your bodies, he says, as living sacrifice. He talks about them being living sacrifices in chapter 1, I mean, and verses 1 and 2. And then he goes on by saying, 
And if you're going to be a living sacrifice, it means that you cannot conform any longer to the molds, methods, and patterns of this world. A transformation needs to take place, and that transformation can only come about by us renewing our minds and being completely different individuals. So here's what that means. A relationship with God, if I'm looking at what Paul's saying, at the onset of my relationship, it means I can't bring the old way of the world into the kingdom of God. There ought to be something different about me. I ought to function different. I ought to behave myself differently. Then in verses 3 to 8, he goes on where he talks about that people ought to conduct themselves with sober judgment. And this concept now, now that your mind is being renewed or have been renewed, there's an expectation of service that comes from you where we use our gifts now to serve others. Very interesting, very interesting. Then when you get to verses 9 through 17, he now picks up this thought and he talks about what the mark of a true Christian is, right? If I'm truly saved, there ought to be some expectation that something about me is different. So notice what he says in verse 9. Love should be genuine, right? Abhor evil. Hold fast to what is good. He talks about this loving one another with brotherly um, love and affection. Verse 14, he says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep, weep right? Do not, let, uh, do not be haughty, it says here, but associate with the lowly and never be wise in your own sight. And then our text picks up. And then he gets to this crazy place where he starts to talk about this issue now of what it means to be who God would have us to be. So here, here's the thought that I want you to take away from the message today. I want you to hear this as we go over the teaching. Vengeance belongs to God. Therefore, do not retaliate against your enemy. Instead, overcome evil with good. Repeat after me. Say, self. Vengeance belong to God. I will not retaliate. Instead, I will overcome evil with good. Yeah, one more time. Say, self. Vengeance belongs to God. I will not retaliate against my enemy. I will overcome evil with good. Easier said than done, but we're going to walk through it. Three simple truths that I want you to take away based on that big idea. Number one, I want us to get in our spirit this concept. I am not charged to retaliate against my enemy. We're going to flesh this out. Because, let me tell you why I'm saying that. By default... If I am a person of the world and you wrong me, by default, I am going to do something to defend myself, to uphold my honor, to not let you feel as if I am less than. And then when we get now to being a kingdom subject, we hear God challenging us to do something completely different. What is that? What does that mean? What is it all about? So look at the text with me. The text says this in verse 17, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And he says this, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I don't think I need to dig deeper into this concept of not repaying evil for evil. I think you're all mature adults and you get the truth of what I'm trying to communicate thus far in the message. But here's what I want you to understand. Paul now is not the first person to vocalize this truth. This is something that has been implied or communicated or taught throughout the history of biblical history from the onset of time. If you were to look into the Old Testament, you would see the same concept being applied in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, if you look at the book of Proverbs, here's how Proverbs says it in the Old Testament, right? If anyone returns evil for good, evil, the text says in Proverbs 17 and 13, will not depart from their house. Here's what that says, and here's what that means. If myself as a parent don't know how to apply the principle that when my enemy wrongs me, I don't position myself to retaliate, but my reciprocation or my action is in the positive sense. If I don't apply that, that could potentially transfer down in my life for generations on end. Let me help you all with this. You ever seen a mean parent? Come on, y'all, talk to me. And then 
ever seen a mean parent and then you look at the children and the children's just as bad. Come on, y'all, right? Here's mommy, here's daddy, right? They're always quick to mouth off. They're all always quick to go off. They're always quick to do something. And then here, here's the dumb part of what I'm saying to you. Then they look at their children, and when the children behaves bad, here's what they say. You need not be so bad. You need not to act like that. And then the parent, the child kind of want to look at them like, And, you know, if they could talk back because, you know, but a bad parent, bad child, that means, right? And, and the child wants to say, well, where do you think I got it from? And that's the principle, you know, is that if we don't conduct ourselves in a godly manner, that thing will transfer down into our household. And, and imagine what happens when they now have offsprings, right? And when their offsprings now have what? offsprings. You see how generationally this thing transfers down when it could easily be cut at the head if the parent would get things right with God. Here's a biblical premise for this principle that I want you not to miss. God's intent for the nation of Israel was this. He was looking to call a group of people that would look so much like him in the earth that when the rest of the world encountered the people of God, it would be as if they encountered God themselves and they would be jealous of this relationship that these people had with they, their God that they now would want to come to a relationship with God. But what happens when the people of God that are in the world don't look like God in the earth, guess what it does to others in the world? Oh, come on, talk to me. It makes them not want to commit because we're no different from them. So even in the Old Testament, um, the author of Proverbs says this, don't, don't return evil for evil. Look at what verse 22 says of chapter 20. Don't say, I will repay evil. It says, wait for the Lord and he will what? That's Old Testament. And, and there's a plethora of Old Testament scriptures that speaks to this truth and communicate this same truth. If we were to look at the New Testament, here's how it sounded in the New Testament. Let me paraphrase a little bit. The New Testament kind of says this. You've heard this in Jesus with the Sermon on the Mount. Most of us think that that's the first time that was communicated. But Jesus now is just being consistent in his delivery. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't repay evil for evil. So here's what the Sermon on the Mount looked like. You have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, it says do what? Ah, we know it. So here's what this looks like. If you're in the parking lot and somebody backs into your car, I see y'all went there already. Here's the first thing we do. No, she did aren't. <laughs> now we want to leave the car, open the door, and go out and give that person a piece of our mind. Right? That's evil for evil. I think this is humorous, but if you read the text and somebody backs into your car, you're supposed to say, hold up, let me turn around so you can get the front too. <laughs> right? We don't think like that. And I'm not saying do that in the literal sense. The, the point of the illustration is that we ought to control ourselves because God's got this, because God wants to use you and he wants to use me as vehicles, as testimonies to bring people into a relationship with him so they can see God in the earth, right? Here's what he says in Luke. Uh, the one who strikes you on the cheek, uh, he says, offer the other, and for the one who takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic. For, I like that. So here's what I mean forget your jacket in church and somebody steals it, you're supposed to take your shirt and hand it to them too. You think we do that? Girl, don't go to that church. There's some thieves up in there. <laughs> That's what we do. That's what we do. And we want to put it in a bulletin. And then, <laughs> and then here's what we do. I know who did it. I know who did it. Y'all know nothing, right? 
But the point, the principle that God is trying, that Jesus is trying to communicate and that Paul is trying to communicate, and and we'll see this in a while, it's not our job to act the way the world does because we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And that transfer means that the reason God brought us out from where we are into where God has us, listen to this, it's not so we can continue conforming to the pattern and the methods of the world, is that now that we're in God's kingdom, but we're placed to reside in the world, when the world encounters us, they ought to see God in us. Oh, come on, come on. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I've got to look like Jesus. Tell the other neighbor, say, other neighbor, I've got to look like Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and look at what the text says. Look at the text before I even go to that. Notice what the verse says, verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is right and honorable. And I love this little prepositional phrase. In the sight of, and the word is all. Come on, say all. all. Come on, once again, say all. all. Let, let me tell you what all mean. All, I say this one. It's a very, very deep, deep Greek word. Yeah, it just means all. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> And here's what that means. The person in your cubicle that you can't stand. Ah. The neighbor that rubs you wrong. They're part of that all. You kind of get what I'm saying? The person who gets on your reserve nerve. They're part of that all. Come on. That family member that nobody speaks to. I wish I had somebody in here. They're part, of, it, it does say all. You kind of get what I'm saying? And, and here's, here's, here's what we do. Here's how we want to interpret all. Only my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's our definition of all. And we feel that this command is issued to only pe- to people within the household of faith, that that is what our interpersonal relationships are supposed to look like. No, 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 no. That's the problem with the church is we're too close community. We're too close-minded where we feel I've only got to be right with you because you know God. No, we have an obligation to be right with the world as well. So when we encounter the world, they don't see the old person, but they see Christ in us. So here's what it sounds like in Matthew, right? Let your light so shine for people that they may see your good works and do what? Give glory to God who is in heaven. All means all. So here's what that means. When that person bumps into you, you don't, oh no, that didn't just happen. You don't go there. We mature to the place that they're coming out all apologetic and they're hurt and they're, they're embarrassed. And, and we have God enough, even though the flesh is willing to rise up, the spirit rises to the occasion and gives them the assurance it's going to be all right. Because God's in control. We must grow to that point. Retaliate or repay to no man evil for evil. Now here's what that means. The reason I said we are citizens of a different world. Listen, you're in the world, but you're not what? Y'all know it. We're in the world, but we're not what? The problem is because we live here and we stay here for so long, we forget where home really is. And so here's Romans 12 again. As opposed to being transformed, we conform because the dictates of the world communicate to us how we live and we forget that we're just resident aliens passing through. This world is not our home and we look more and more like the world. We must remember that we are citizens of a different world. Secondly, we must recognize who the true enemy is. This is important. This is important. This is important. This is important. And you'll see why in a little while. Here's what Ephesians 6 says, right? Let me quote it real quick. We wrestle not against what? But against what? Principalities and powers and rules, forces of evil in heavenly realms. So it says what? Put on the whole armors of God that when the day of evil come, we might be able to do what? Take our stand. Take our stand. See, the problem with, with, with how we interpret take our stand, we think that we can, it, it's, it's going to be only about spiritual warfare and it's not going to be about engaging the world. When you engage the world and the, the world enders, renders to you evil, you can take your stand. And here's what taking my stand means. I don't look like them. Here's what taking your stand means. I don't behave like them. But here's the problem. If I don't have on the whole armor of God, when the day of evil comes, guess what I'm going to do? Oh, it's on, baby. It's on. And we'll forget whose we are because you will start looking just like the world. So you, 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 you must understand it. 
Your enemy is not the human being that's confronting you at the time. The human being that's confronting you is simply a vehicle that's being used by Satan or the enemy himself to get to you. So here's what we've got to be able to do. We must grow to the point in our walk with God where it doesn't matter when the day of evil comes and you find yourself in a confrontational situation, we can look past the person that's going off on us and see the enemy that's behind all of this and respond the way Jesus did. As opposed to going off on them and giving them a piece of your mind because of what's happening, you just hold your peace and you say, get thee behind me, Satan. And in case they look at you and say, oh, who you calling Satan? You just simply calmly say, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the person that's using you. That, that changes things, Right? So here's what that means. Here's what that means. There's a both a, a positive and negative to this. If I find myself going off or rendering evil for evil, guess what that means? I now have allowed who? The enemy to access me, to use me as a vehicle for his benefit. So I've got to be careful. So here's the bottom line with don't give evil for evil, right? The moment I start returning the favor, guess who's using me? It's not God. So here's what that says in English. Don't position yourself so the enemy could use you for his benefit. So when evil comes, let God shine. Oh my gosh. When evil comes, look like Jesus. When evil comes, hold your peace and don't respond the way the world would. My good, that's, that's, that, that's tough, but it's, it's truth, right? So here, here's a couple of things real quick as we look at the text, right? So here's what verse 19 says before I make that point. Verse 19 says, and I'm going to say this real quick, then I'm going to move on. If possible, so far as it depends on you. If possible, verse 19 says, so far as it depends on you. If possible, so far as it, one more time. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Here's what that conditional clause if says. That the possibility exists that you might not be able to bring peace to every situation. Right? Come on, y'all. There's some things you just can't fix. So that means peace, then, is not attainable in every relationship. So here's what I do. I don't conform to the world. Some things we've just got to walk away from. Oh, come on, y'all. Some things you just walk away from to maintain your peace. You don't have to stand there and defend and do all that stuff. The point is you do everything humanly possible, godly possible within you to maintain the peace. And if the person chooses not to retaliate, that is not your responsibility. You move on. Here's, here, here's, here's a principle a mentor of mine taught me very, very early in life. Felix, he said, you are not responsible for how others treat you, but you're responsible for how you treat others. So here's what that means. When I get to heaven, God's not going to say to me, hey, Felix, um, why didn't Bernard not like you? He's not going to say that. But here's what he can ask me. What's wrong with you that you couldn't get it right with Bernard? Now, Bernard and I ain't got no issues, so don't nobody walk out of here because I know church people. Amen? Y'all don't make stuff up. Amen? I got Facebook pass. I got a problem with Bernard. No. All right? Stop it. <laughs> Tell him be, yeah, stop it. We good. All right? So I'm responsible for me, so it's up to me to do everything humanly possible to keep the peace. And where it's not possible, I walk away, listen to this, but I keep the door open for reconciliation. Because here's what we do. Here's what we do. Sister or brother wrongs us, here's what we do. We try to get it right for about two seconds. They ain't want to make it right, I'm done. Right? And, 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 and the sad commentary is this. For the remainder of our Christian life on earth, that door is closed. And the Word of God is not teaching us that, okay? You walk away, but you leave the door open because you have no idea what God is doing in the life of the other person. 
Oh, come on, say amen with me. The reason I'm comfortable saying that, because like Paul would say to the Romans, such were some of us, right? Before we came to a relationship with God, we were hard-hearted. We were callous. We were hard-headed. But it took the love of God to penetrate our hearts so we could repent and turn from our wicked ways. And so when you find ourselves in these relationships that's not right, we walk away, but we don't block the number. Come on, y'all. We don't. Because at any moment, God could touch the heart of that person such that they can come and say, hey, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so forth, you know what? I was wrong, but I saw myself in the presence of God, and I need you to forgive me. And here's your responsibility when that happens. You cannot repay evil for evil. I was waiting for you to come back. No. Baby, you show them God in you. Because God has made their hearts soft and they're coming to you, they should encounter the same God that convicted them. Oh, Jesus, y'all talk to me. Two more real quick. Disagreement does not mean we can't live in peace, okay? So here, this, is, this is huge for me right now with all the political unrest that's going on in our country. Here's what the church looks like. Because a person's Republican... They can't get along with a person who's Democrat, Democratic. And the other way around, because a person's Democratic, they can't disagreement. And we're going so far as to calling each other evil. We can disagree, but because we love the same God, we should be able to fellowship. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on, y'all. Are you with me? There's disagreement in my homes at all points in time but I'm committed to this woman, so I'm not going to break fellowship because of a disagreement. Does this make sense? And we need to learn that principle in the body of Christ. The church right now is so divided over political issues, over social issues and issues that are going on. We can disagree, but we should still be able to walk hand in hand because of the common God that's in us. There ought to be grace for that. This last one real quick. Social activism is very, very different from retaliation. I need to say this point really quick, then I'm going to move on. Let me tell you what I mean by that, right? If I'm fighting for what's right, does not mean I'm retaliating. Now, let me, let me clean that up. Back in, was it 60s and 50s, 60s, when the whole 60s, when the whole civil rights movement was prominent, don't make the mistake of thinking what Dr. Martin Luther King was doing was retaliating. He was fighting for what's right. You kind of get what I'm saying? Micah speaks to that. I have have an obligation by virtue of the fact that I'm a child of God to do justice and to live peace. So that means when I see an image bearer being mistreated as a child of God, I ought to stand up for that image bearer because an injustice is being done. And injustice, fighting against injustice is not retaliation. We were all made in the image of God, created equally to look like God, and we ought to defend each other. But we ought to do that in peace and in love love and in the heart of God. Let me tell you what this looked like during the civil rights. This is why Dr. King could lead protests and march and people were being beat and they were being hit and they were going through all this stuff, but the communication of nonviolence still existed. Be God in the midst of the injustices, but stand for what's right. That's very different than retaliation or giving evil for evil because the moment you hit me and I hit you back and the moment you shoot me and I'm going to lead a protest to shoot everybody, I am rendering evil for evil and that is not the heart of God. Let me go here and this is going to offend some of y'all. The moment you hit me and I start burning buildings. I'm rendering evil for evil. And that does not look like the heart of God. Social injustice is not that. Two more things and I'm done. Watch this. So then vengeance belong to who? Come on, say it again. Vengeance belong to who? And, and here's the converse that I'm going to read the text. I cannot repay evil because God's got my back. 
right? So here's my neighborhood fighting. I'm reading the text. When, 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 when my neighborhood would get in trouble, and remember, I'm rolling nine deep with my family members, and I had one brother that had gotten really good at that karate thing, right? And so what would happen, the neighbor would hit me, I'd go grab him, his name was Chassie, and, and I'd put him in front. Now, I started the mess, but I'm behind the pile. I was, by then, I was tall and skinny and ain't had no muscles or nothing, so I couldn't fight worth nothing. And he'd be in front, and as long as Chassie was in front, we were good because he was the baddest dude on the block with that karate stuff. You kind of get what I'm saying? And here's what Jesus is saying. If you're going to engage your enemy, put me in front. I wish I had somebody in here. You, 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 don't need, you don't need to put yourself in front because he's the baddest somebody on the block. And here's the depth of this. Here's the depth of what I'm really coming to. If, if the wrestle is not against flesh and blood, if you're not my enemy, if my brother and my sister is not my enemy, but the devil really is my enemy, do I think I have what's cap- the capacity to engage the enemy? enemy? No, I step back and let Jesus handle him because he demonstrated 2,000 years ago on Calvary, he's already won the fight. He's already won it. So he's like, put me in front because the vengeance, he says, belongs to me. So look at the text. Look at the text. Here's what the text says. Verse 19, beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it. And it says to the what? Wrath of God, for it is written, written, vengeance is mine. I will do what? Repay, says the Lord. Grandma them had, they said it this way, if I hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle. Yeah, and and when you look at that concept of vengeance throughout Scripture, it kind of talks about the vengeance of the Lord. We don't have time to go into that, but, but here's the thing. Here's how Jesus says it in the earth realm. Let the wheat and the tares grow together. And in the end, he says, I will do the separating. Not that it's our job to separate. I got that because here's the principle. You don't know what I'm doing in the life of the tear right now to bring it to relationship with me. Right? And if we interrupt what God is doing with our own flesh, we might lose that person. So here's Jesus said, if one of you cause one of those little ones to go astray, better if a millstone were hang around your neck. And sometimes we just got to learn how to stay out of God's way. Come on, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, stay out of God's way. So, so number two, vengeance belongs to God. Here's the third thing that I'm done. We overcome evil with what? Come on, <laughs> one more time. We overcome evil with what? Look at the last two verses. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, you do what? If he's thirsty, give him what? Let me tell you what that means. You in Starbucks and you buying your drink and your enemy roll up behind you. Here's what you got to do. I got his too. <laughs> it doesn't say you got to be happy about it, all right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but you've got to take care of it, right? You serve them, you serve them, you serve them. And, and, and the principle that I'm communicating here is you serve with kindness and the love of God. Let me tell you why. Why? Because when we were enemies with God, he served us with what? I wish I had somebody in here and his love. And if we're going to be the God representatives in the earth realm, we have an obligation to continually look like Christ. So here's what it says. Here's what it says. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on their head. Let me just do something with that text really, really quick. Here's what heaping burning coals on their head means. There was an old Egyptian... um, concept that when a person messed up, they would take this big bowl and they would place it on their head and they would put fire and coals in the head. And the person had to walk around with that thing on their head, burning their scalp the whole time. And the premise in the Egyptian mindset was that this, is that when you're truly repentive, you'll be all right. You'll be position to take the thing off. But as long as you were unrepentant, you had to keep that thing there. So the purpose of the coal on the head was to demonstrate that you're truly repentive and you're ready to take it off, right? So here's what the text says, is if we can kill hatred with love, it might draw the person to a place of repentance. But here's what happens. If we do hatred with hatred, excuse the term, but we tick them off even more. 
At some point, they might want to say, well, why are you being so kind to me? And you can't say, because I have to. Don't do that. You say, because how God loved me. And because God was kind to me. So I have an obligation to look like God. Amen? Y'all remember Dylan Roof? Dylan was that guy that walked into that church in South Carolina and killed those nine worshipers in their context. The story continues like this. Several days later, I think it was like two days after they captured Dylan, they had him in court for his bail or bond hearing, and then um, the families of the deceased showed up in the court because they wanted to have voice into what Dylan had done. Now, here's what I said to you. If it was me, I'm not sure how I'm going to respond. Can we be honest if it's you? I'm not sure. Some of y'all won't make it through the metal detectors. Because, you, you know, you be going to court. Come on, let's can be honest. Can stuff, right? <laughs> let's just be real here. Let's be real here. So I don't know how I respond, but Dylan showed up in court. And some of the members of the families that were deceased showed up in court from that Bible study. Here's a couple of quotes from them. This is Anthony Thompson, the wife. Uh, his wife was murdered by Dylan in the shooting in the church. Here's what he said when he had a chance to speak to Dylan in front of that judge. I forgive you. My family forgives you. But we would like for you to take this opportunity to repent and change your ways. Oh, my gosh. Come on, y'all. Oh, my gosh. Look at this one. Here is what Wanda Simons, the granddaughter of Daniel Simmons, who was murdered by a roof in the church shooting. Although my grandfather and the other victims died at the hands of hate, this is proof everyone's plea for your soul is proof they lived in love and their legacy will live in love. So hate won't what? I don't know if I'm saying that. You kind of get what I'm saying? This shows what it really means to render no one evil for evil, and it shows the impact that that Bible study was really having on the members of the church. Here's what Dr. Martin Luther King said in one of his most famous quotes. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Here's what a famous commentator, F.F. F. Bruce, says. The best way to get rid of an enemy is to turn them into a friend. I like that. And so I like that. Because at one point in time, I was an enemy to God. Come on, y'all. And while I was God's enemy, the Bible says he went to Calvary and he died for me. And look at what he did. He turned an enemy into a friend, right? And now I'm a friend of God. You kind of get what I'm saying. And here's the charge. Here's the charge. Here's the charge to you. And here's the charge to me. Those people who are enemies with us, we have an obligation to do what God did for us now to go and turn them into friends so they can see the love of God. Come on, y'all. That's hard work, but it's a challenge. It's what God called us to do. We want to put an end to the hatred that's going on in the world. The church has work to do to make friends with people who are enemies with God to bring them into a relationship. Isn't that what Calvary's all about? Isn't that why he went to Calvary? To die for you and to die for me and to die for people in the world so we can be friends? My challenge is that God has speaking. Allow God to be God this morning. Bow your heads with me as our elders come and pass the baton and come. We want to share. Father, you're awesome. Father, you're wonderful. Father, you're gracious. Father, you're kind. Thank you for this word, God. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for who you are. I'm praying that as your word has gone forth, should there be one here, God, whose heart had been hurt by someone, we pray for repentance, number one, and that the evil thoughts be done away with. We realize that our call is to make friends, to forgive, to love. Vengeance belongs to you, God. So we don't repay evil for evil, but we overcome evil with good. So God, if there's one here that did not know that you died to be friends with them, 
Bring them to a relationship, God, so that they can be one with you. Move in this place, God, in your name. Amen. Come on, let's all stand to our feet. As we stand to our feet.